Welcome to our next in our series on spirituality and awareness. And uh, we're building a story here. We're building a theme around the importance of awareness. And my next guest, I'm so excited to be interviewing Bishop John Shelby Spong. And uh, he'll be known to most of you. If you don't know Bishop Spong, let me give you a brief introduction to him. And then I'm going to dive in to a conversation with him, which I'm very excited about. So Bishop Spong was the, uh, the Episcopal Bishop of Newark, New Jersey for over 20 years, but his life became really interesting after he retired in 2000 when he could devote more time to writing and to speaking, and since then has sold over a million copies of a number of books, and uh, everywhere I go I meet people who credit Bishop Spong with having saved their faith. So a truly significant man uh, in our generation. And uh, some of his books, Liberating the Gospels, Rescuing the Bible from Fundamentalism, The Sins of Scripture, Here I Stand, and uh, Why Christianity Must Change or Die, and Jesus for the Non-Religious are just some of the titles of his books. And you can get a sense even from those titles of the significance of what Bishop Smong talks about. So that's just a little about this man. Uh, excited to dive into a conversation with him and we're particularly talking today because Bishop Spong, one of his greatest influences has been around reinterpreting the Bible for people to read uh, with, you know, with common sense, with current uh, understandings, etc. That's been huge for so many people. The topic today for our conversation is really theism and awareness and so to begin with, thank you Bishop Spong for being with us for this Bye. time. Very, very grateful and very honored. I want to start by asking you about some of your big influences as you think about theism and awareness, in particular, Paul Tillich, who spoke about the shock of non-being, and you might be able to explain that a little for us, and also Freud, who talked about the trauma of self-consciousness. So why don't you talk to us about some of the influences that have brought you to your particular view of awareness and theism? Well, it's been certain theologians as well as certain scientists, like Freud, another one would be Galileo, another one would be Isaac Newton. These are people who change the perception of the world in which we live. And my understanding of the Christian faith is that we've got to adapt to those changes or we have no future. Uh, if, you're, if you spend your time as a Christian still assuming that the earth is the center of a three-tier universe and a, a being called God and and interpreted as a supreme father figure is above the sky looking down and keeping record books up to date ready to assign you to either bliss or pain uh, and you act as if this God can intervene into human history at any moment and do miracles for which you constantly pray one way or another then I think that Christianity in particular and religion in general based on this theistic understanding of God has no no real future I don't think you can communicate that in a world that no longer thinks that way. So I think most of our religious symbols come out of what I would call the childhood of our past history. When we thought of ourselves as children and thought of God as the parent figure above the sky and that God was directing all the affairs of the universe and that our only duty was to uh, learn about this God and obey this God and serve this God and, and we would somehow share in God's eternity. That's the kind of Christianity in which I was reared as a child in the Bible Belt of the South, it still has great power in some parts of the world, particularly in, in some of the third world nations where they have not yet embraced the Copernicum Revolution and the Galileo Revolution and the Isaac Newton Revolution and the Sigmund Freud Revolution and Charles Darwin Revolution. In fact, the church spends more of its energy fighting Charles Darwin today in fundamentalistic circles in almost any other place. Now, if you take that background, then who are the theologians that have tried to get us beyond this rather childish pattern of believing and into a, a kind of dialogue between our humanity and whatever is, whatever is beyond our humanity? And it's that point that Paul Tillich, who is probably the shaping theologian of my early life, I think he died about 1963 or maybe 65, he was a German reform theologian, much influenced by Zwingli, and he came to the United States primarily to get out of Hitler's Germany uh, and taught at both Harvard and Union and I think probably was the seminal theologian for a generation of, 
of clergy in America in all denominations. One of the things that Tillich is known for is, is that he would not use personal words to describe God. And of course, his religious critics said, well, Tillich believes in an impersonal God. That's simply a caricature of his position. What he was saying is that personal words are simply not big enough to embrace the mystery of, of ultimacy, which is what he called God, or what he thought of God as being. And so every time you use a personal word, you actually make God smaller in everybody's mind than God can possibly be. And he, he did his dialogue, and it's really what it was. He was a, a dialogical theologian. His dialogue was between God and being, <clears throat> between Christ and existence, and being between the spirit and the world. And all of these were they basically are the titles of these three volumes of systematic theology. If God is not a being, then how does anyone relate to God? That became the, the ultimate question that Tillich raised. And the threat of non-being that you refer to is, is the threat that we might cease to be. If God is being, then to cease to be is to, is to suddenly be apart from that which is ultimate, that which is real, that which is eternal. And you you drive, or I drive, I can't speak for many people, I drive this theology back into anthropology. The Christian view of human life is that we are fallen. So we concocted this myth of there was a perfect world in which we lived symbolically at one with God. This is the Garden of Eden myth. And we disobeyed God's command and God banished us from the garden into the world of existence and we could never get back in so that we are fallen people, that's the definition. Well, that might have made sense before the writings of Charles Darwin. It's a, it's a good myth, but it was an interpretive myth, and it probably made sense. But when you read Darwin and understand Darwin, you suddenly recognize that there is no such thing as a perfect beginning, that we have evolved over hundreds of millions, billions, maybe, maybe 3.8 billion years that we think life has been on this planet Earth, We've evolved from, from something, we've evolved into higher and higher levels of consciousness. We, we understand that. Um, that insect is conscious, but not a very deep level of consciousness. Birds have a little higher level of consciousness. Uh, mammals seem to have a higher level of consciousness than, than uh, reptiles. And human beings possess something that's quite unique, I think. It's not unique in the sense that it's separated from everything else, but it's unique in the sense that we've crossed a boundary that, to our knowledge, no other creature has, has crossed. That is, we have become self-conscious people. And to be self-conscious means, first, that you know that you are finite. I don't know how much animals know of their finitude. There's some rumors about elephants and things like that. Uh, but we don't know how they are, are aware of it. I know that animals don't spend most of their waking days thinking about the fact that they're going to die someday. But I think most human beings do, particularly when death crosses their lifeline for the first time. Uh, I can remember the first time I dealt with death. It was a fish, a tiny little fish, very alive one day and floating on top of the water the next day. I was maybe two, maybe three, I don't know. But suddenly it became, I became aware that something that is living can cease to be living. I still didn't identify that myself with me because I wasn't a fish. But as you grow older, then you recognize that living is always a finite thing. And then you begin to have people that you know die. My grandfather died when I was maybe three or four years old. Suddenly he was no longer part of my life. I had a classmate at age seven who got killed in an automobile accident. Suddenly there was a desk with an empty chair in, it in my classroom. So I had to grapple with, with these realities. And as you begin to think about death, then you begin to touch one of the things that I think motivates every living thing. As far as I can see in my study of life, whether it's insect life or plant life or animal life or higher mammal life or human life, every living thing is ultimately motivated to survive. Darwin sort of understood this. He bases his whole evolutionary theory on the struggle to survive. To be alive is to struggle to survive. Now, how does that manifest itself in self-conscious creatures? It manifests itself by, by our knowing that we are limited. 
and by making survival our highest goal, which inevitably means we relate to everything else from the vantage point of our own survival, which makes us radically self-centered people. This is observable in all of life. And I think that our ancient forebears looked at this manifestation in human behavior, that we're all self-centered creatures, and they assumed the story of the fall. That is, we, have, we must have fallen from our glory because we still remember it, we still yearn to get back to it. And so the myth of the Garden of Eden was developed. And then the tragedy with the Christian faith, I think, is that we began to interpret Jesus in terms of that myth. That's not really original Christianity. That's really what 4th century Council of Nicaea Christianity got around to doing. They were so determined to define Jesus in terms of humanity and divinity without wrecking either the humanity or the divinity. They were trying to put oil and water together in some sort of form where it would fit. So you get this convoluted creedal theology of the 4th century and we have bought into it from that day until maybe the last 50 years when people have begun to question it. And what I think we've got to do, what I've got to do, my vocation as a part of this thing called the Christian Church, is to force the experience of God that we believe we have in the person of Jesus into dialogue with the world in which we live. Not the world we pretend to live in, but the world in which we live. And see if there is a way to transcend our own survival mentality break into what I would call a new understanding of awareness, to use your word, a new understanding of consciousness would be the, the way I would prefer to phrase it, in which maybe there is an ultimate communion between the self and the whatever we call the ultimate. And I think that's the way Christian faith has got to, to move if it's going to live. And I'm not sure that the Christian faith in a thousand years, if it's still around, will look anything like what we call Christianity today. I think we've got to be open to that and aware of that and not fearful about moving beyond our security limits in, in our religious vocabulary. Mm -hmm. that, they, that made me, all, I'm always a sort of uncomfortable person living within the framework of 21st century organized religion. And yet I don't want to abandon it because I see no evidence in history that you move from what is into what can be except by staying within the patterns that you, you place yourself into. But they've got to always be growing. Even Christianity is not new. It grew out of Judaism. So I think Christianity and religion is always evolving. And the only way I know how to be involved in that growth process is to be in it and to struggle to make it go beyond its limits into what can be even more. It's a rather exciting it's a really exciting time, an exciting place, rather exciting vocation, I think, for, for those of us who want to engage in this task. Thank you, Bishop Swanland. <laughs> Powerful words. Uh, you just mentioned at the end there, you talked about security. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit to how theism and some of the other more traditional beliefs have fed our desire for security rather than truth. Yeah, well, I think that's exactly if you look back at, uh, at the classical way we've understood God, it's always been as an authority figure. God is either a parent or a judge, sometimes both. And sometimes we've made that parent a very angry parent, and sometimes that judge is clearly a hanging judge, and it reduces us human beings to sort of groveling before this authority figure and begging for mercy. I think one of the things that repels me most when I go to an Anglican church is that we spend so blessed much time begging God to have mercy. I think that's a really weird prayer for a human being who is supposed to be in the image of God and a child of God to pray to the one who's supposed to be the creator of all. I can understand an abusive child standing before an abusing parent begging for mercy. That makes sense to me. And I can understand a convicted felon standing before a hanging judge begging for mercy in the sentencing. But for the life of me, I don't understand image of human beings groveling uh, in some sort of penitence before a heavenly God who doesn't look very loving and begging for mercy. The rest of our liturgy, it seems to me, does the same thing. Uh, you can't go to an Anglican church and use the Book of Common Prayer without being told over and over again how wretched, miserable, sinful, broken, fallen, inadequate you are. 
I don't know anybody, Ian, that's ever been helped by being told how inadequate they are. That just doesn't seem to be a pattern uh, or a prescription for anything except more guilt or more sense of inadequacy. But we tell ourselves that we have, there's no health in us, that we've done the things we ought not to have done, we've not done the things we ought to have done. We say that, that we're not worthy even to gather up the crumbs that fall from the divine table. We use terrible language about ourselves, and our hymns are just filled with it. You know, this uh, sort of this dreadful hymn, well, they're all dreadful. But we can't, even, we can't even talk about how amazing God's grace is without reminding ourselves that the reason God's grace is so amazing is that it saved a wretch like you and me. So it's always self-denigrating stuff. Uh, if you look at the history of prejudice in this country, black people have been taught by the white authorities to think of themselves as inferior and adequate. And it's been a terrible struggle for black people, particularly in America, and I suspect in South Africa too. Maybe it might be in the aboriginal population of Australia. It's a very difficult thing for people who have been told by the cultural norm that they are inadequate, inferior, that they are non-whites, and have them have a deep sense of their own worth and dignity. And yet that's the heart of the Christian message, it seems to me. But it's not one we've been able to hear. I find it rather fascinating that if you look at the history of Christianity, we spend an awful lot of time denigrating Jews. During the Crusades, we spent an awful lot of time denigrating the Muslims. We've denigrated women. We've told women that they were not educable. We even debated whether women should be uh, baptized at one point in our history. We certainly have debated, and still debated in some of the more backward parts of the Anglican Church, whether women are capable of being priests. Uh, all of that suggests that somehow women are inferior to men. And of course, we've had slavery. Uh, Christians have been in slave business. The Pope has owned slaves. Part of my country where slavery lived as a way of life is called the Bible Belt, where everybody goes to church more often, talks about God more often, reads the Bible more often, but they still practice slavery. And then when slavery was ended, and it was ended on the battlefield, it wasn't ended because people's hearts were converted. It ended because they were defeated in battle. Then we instituted segregation, which is nothing except the bastard stepchild of slavery. It's designed to keep the race is separate and inferior. And apartheid was the name of this in South Africa. And that was, and the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa was fully supportive of that. In the battle that goes on in our society today about gay and lesbian people, it's primarily the Christian Church in both the Catholic and Protestant form that spends its time denigrating homosexual people and telling them that they are sick or mentally ill or evil or depraved and and then expecting them to act like normal people after they've been told all their lives how sick, sinful, depraved, and awful they are. It's a terrible way we've, we've interpreted the Christian faith. When I search deeply into the scriptures, I find over and over again that the primary message that comes through about Jesus is that we are called into a new humanity where we are related to one another as part of a family. And as Paul says in Galatians, but if you get inside the Christ experience, the differences between men and women, Jews and Greeks, bond and free, disappear. Uh, St. Luke says when the Holy Spirit fell upon the church at Pentecost, it didn't make people religious. It didn't even make them spiritual. It called them out of their tribal boundaries into a new sense of what it means to be human so they could communicate across all tribal boundaries. Over and over again, it does I penetrate the stories in the gospel. Uh, that's what the Jesus message is, to transcend the limits of our humanity and to form a new sense of community based upon the reality of human life. And I think that's a pretty exciting goal, but it's not one that I see the church particularly welcoming. Uh, we don't welcome it in the political process either. In this country, we have the honor, and I think it is an honor, of having our first African-American president. But the hostility and the racism involved in the opposition to this man is so intense that it's uh, almost appalling. And we have, we have politicians in this country that it's not the issue. It's that if Obama is for it, they cannot be for it. They have to be against it. Now, I don't mean to say that everything that Mr. Obama has proposed has been outstanding. But the way you solve things is that you're in the political dialogue and you don't start a stone wall and say, if you propose it, we will oppose it. Uh, because we're still dealing with latent racism. Now, we'll get over it. It'll take another couple of generations. Uh, 
We've got a woman in the wings now waiting to be nominated to be president. And unless something happens, I think she's probably going to be elected. So the people that couldn't adjust to an African-American president are still going to have four to eight years of adjusting to a female president. And it's just going to be the same issues all over again. But part of what it means to me to be a Christian is to get beyond the defining barriers, which are part of our security system, um, part of our survival mentality. And once we do that, um, tribalism in our world is going to disappear. I think the God who has a chosen people is going to disappear. That's a very strange concept. You know, if, if the Jews are God's chosen people, everybody's not Jewish, it's God's unchosen people. And so if God didn't choose them, it's okay for us to hate them too. Uh, prejudice is so deep and tribal prejudice is so deep. And you have it in every country in the world. You have it within the country and you have it with beyond the boundaries of the country. And all of these are survival techniques. And they're all manifestations of our inability to be who we are without uh, trying to build ourselves up by tearing somebody else down. That's the anthropology that I think we've got to get past. And Christianity has based itself on what I think is a false understanding of human life. And therefore, it cannot possibly do anything more than develop a false theology based upon that diagnosis. We've got to get beyond both of them. That would be an interesting thing to try. Uh, I don't think many congregations can be very eager to enter that, enter that experience because they're so comfortable with the patterns of history. But a few will. That's really all it takes. Some big ideas there. I just want to see if I can summarize some of what you've said and correct me if I've if I've misrepresented any of this. The first big idea I'm hearing is that with the advent of self awareness in humanity, that we we had a new trauma and the trauma was realizing that we're finite. The trauma was realizing that one day we would not be the death would eventually take us. And that trauma led us as human beings to create systems of security so that uh, we could actually fill the fear of not being with, even if they're not true, even if they're not real, we're going to fill those fears with beliefs. The fire and, of our anxiety. That's, what, and that's primarily the focus of religion. Okay. So that's the, that's the first big idea is that the advent of self-awareness actually led to us creating systems of security that may not be true or real, or certainly not valid with modern minds. The second big idea I'm hearing from you, which is where I hear you get very excited, is talking about a new consciousness that transcends this limited sense of self-awareness that is just fear-based. And I've actually, I've got a quote of yours here that might lead to some more comments from you. You said, and this is particularly talking about John's Gospel, because I know that you've made quite a study of that recently. John's Jesus is not about saving sinners and rescuing the lost. It's about moving beyond self-consciousness to universal consciousness. Can you comment on that, on that quote? It's one of my favorite quotes, anyway. Nice, mine too. Yeah, it's, uh, I think that's, where, that's the business we're in. And I think if we understand the faith tradition which has nurtured me all of my life, it has very little to do with the manifestation of Christianity in the world in which I live. Because it's about rescuing the fallen. And I think it needs to be about encouraging the being to emerge into new forms. And that's where the future is. You see, even, even the idea, the, the central premises of what people think Christianity is would be the Incarnation and the Trinity. But the Incarnation and the Trinity are both ideas of this God who is external is going to be something to us or for us. And it becomes terribly important that, that we hold these doctrines inviolable. That's why in every part of religion there is an attempt to move the religious symbols into some sort of total authority. That's why the Pope has to be infallible. That's why the Bible has to be inerrant. That's why every church thinks it's the one true church. Because if you're not, then this debilitating doubt might still creep in and, and this religious system will make you secure. See, I think what the Christian faith is supposed to do is to give us the courage to live as radically insecure people and to keep putting one foot in front of another as we walk into the emerging world and into the rising consciousness. When you get to this place, Ian, vocabulary is very hard. 
because you're talking about something that's beyond time and space, and all the vocabulary we've got to use is bound by time and space. So you can only approach this sort of by analogy or by image or by symbol, and that doesn't give people security. You know, the Christian faith is a walk into the ultimate mystery of God. It's a walk into a deeper understanding of self-awareness and self-consciousness. It's a walk beyond individuality into community in the deepest sort of sense where all the boundaries that separate me from every other person will disappear. And that's a very different, difficult thing to talk about. When I wrote my book on eternal life, it's the hardest book I ever wrote. Probably the reason is that I was writing about something I didn't know anything about. And it's very difficult to write about something you don't know anything about. But I have some intimations about it. I have some experiences that lead me beyond boundaries into something that's different. Uh, I have a relationship with my wife in particular, in particular, who it's the deepest sort of relationship I've ever had with anybody. And suddenly my boundaries disappear in my relationship with her, and I hope her boundaries disappear in her relationship with me. And we discover a new sense of being. Now, if you can take that analogy, and for everybody when I'm lecturing on this, I tell people to try, try to remember when they fell in love for the first time. And what happens when you fall in love is that somebody else besides yourself is more important to you than you are yourself. You do anything for the sake of the beloved. You desire her, in my case, her happiness more than you desire your own happiness. And that's a movement beyond the boundaries of my humanity. And it's a fairly rare experience, and in human circles, it doesn't tend to last forever. That if people fall in love, if they can only remember it. They don't sort of live in that ecstatic state for very long in most cases. I think I'm probably luckier than most. I think you are too, as a matter of fact. I know your wife so well. But uh, those are the things that make the difference to me. Now, if you, can, if you can have an intimation of what it means to be alive in a relationship with someone that you love more than you love yourself and that she loves you more than she loves herself, then I think you have an analogy by which we can begin to talk about eternity, about transcending the limits of consciousness, about transcending the limits of awareness. And we begin to think of God not as a old man in the sky or any other theistic image, but as the ultimate source of life and love and being, so that when I live fully, I manifest the life of God. When I love beyond my boundaries, I manifest the love of God. When I have the courage to be all that I can be and allow you to be all that you can be without feeling pushed down by your being raised up, then I think you've reached a new level of consciousness and I think you have a new understanding of who God is or what God is. And I'm not even sure the word God is the right word to use to describe that experience, but we don't have any other. So we take what we have and try to expand its meaning. Wow, that's huge. All right, what I love about what I'm hearing from you is that the old framework was based on fear. You know, this feel, this need for security, but we're going to fill it with a fear-based system. And the new universal consciousness that you're talking about is built on love. And you're particularly equating that with, you know, romantic love, but it could also equate to other types of love, I'm guessing, like, you know, the passion for justice, uh, the, you know, the delight in nature, these sorts of things also can fill that need that we have to feel connected beyond ourselves. It's so exciting. And for you, uh, Jesus became, you know, one of the gateways to seeing life with that breadth of consciousness, is that right? This is particularly the Johannine Jesus. I'm not sure Paul's Jesus gets us there. Mm -hmm. Paul was really into sin and fall and guilt and grace. But when when John portrays Jesus, he's, he makes the cross the, the center of his gospel, the climax, not the resurrection, not the ascension. He makes the cross because the cross illustrates for John, I believe, human life that is free to give itself away that has achieved a different level of consciousness. That's why the Jesus of John's Gospel never wrestles in the Garden of Gethsemane about whether or not he shall drink this cup. He says, I was born for this. This is the whole purpose of my life. And that's why John's Jesus does not ever say, my God, why have you forsaken me from the cross? Because the cross is the moment in which he's glorified. Uh, when I am lifted up, says John, Johanna, and Jesus, that's when I'll draw all people to myself because I have no agenda to build myself on. 
it's a whole different. And so I see, I find John's gospel really opening me into a, a mystical awareness of God that is where I believe the Christian faith has got to move in the next century if it's going to survive. It's got to move beyond all of the symbols of its past, but I don't want it to. I don't want it to move in a place that you don't recognize where our roots are. And we got to move beyond our manifestations. But I don't know that you have to move beyond your roots. And maybe the unfolding of religion among human beings is the, the unfolding of meaning that you've got to finally get beyond so that you understand the roots out of which it comes and then can transcend its, all of its limits. I think a mystical Jesus and a mystical Christianity may well be what the future holds for us. And that's why John is, I think John's a mystical gospel. The, the worst thing we do to John is to treat it as if it's literal. I don't think Jesus said a word that's attributed to him in the fourth gospel. I don't think he did any of the deeds. I don't think for a moment that he changed water into wine at the wedding feast and came back down with it. I don't think for a moment that he actually raised the four days dead Lazarus from the tomb when he got up and walked back out and sat down and had dinner. I just think that's to totally misunderstand. I think what John is saying is that we've got to be transformed in every stage of life, and finally even death has got to be transformed. Uh, but it's not transformed in a resuscitated body back in the world. And that's not what the resurrection ever was. That's what the resurrection of Jesus has come to be to an awful lot of people. Where I want to go now in conversation with you is to try and draw together the, the sense you're talking about this new consciousness, a universal consciousness. Presumably the only way we can access that or experience it is through our own awareness. And that's why I use the word awareness, but I totally see where you're coming from to use the word consciousness. So the only way we can uh, have any experience of this universal consciousness is through our own awareness. Would you agree with that? Yes, I do. In which case, how do we, how do we shape a universal awareness? How do we practice or live this type of consciousness? Well, Lawrence, I've known you. You've always asked questions that drove me to the edges. Uh, I think you do it in a lot of ways. I think it starts in relationships. I think you have to have community to do it. I don't think that uh, I don't think Christianity is an individual sport. I think it's a team sport. Uh, but you've got to have a community where you can grow. And I feel that the judgment I would make about most manifestations of Christian community is that the community is where you go to be propagandized. It's not a community where you go to grow. I think I'm really fortunate in that uh, I have a worship community. Uh, this is St. Peter's Church, rather traditional church. We have an incredible woman pastor, director. Uh, and, and she, her great gift, it seems to me, is that she touches the emotions of people and demands a sort of emotional response in her sermons. It's not academic, it's not intellectual. I don't mean she's apart from that, she's very bright. But her whole, her whole interest is to make people look into themselves, see themselves, and transcend their limits. And it's really kind of one of the experiences. And we, we build around her gifts. We build around her a lot of little groups of people that are working in various different ways, a men's Bible study group, a women's Bible study group. That sounds like so boring, but these things are places where real life is happening. We had a newcomers group, about 40 people, and they formed such a powerful community that when they joined the church in confirmation, they didn't want the group to stop. They, so they still have a post-confirmation group because they formed a community. and it's, They have levels of honesty, and they can talk about real issues with one another. As much as I dislike the Alpha program of the Church of England, uh, because I think its theology is sort of 18th century, what the Alpha program did was to form community. You know, it started with dinners and it bound people together in, in discussion. And I think that pattern is something that, uh, that really is a powerful one. So I think it, you've got to have relationships of love and trust, and then you've got to be able to share those relationships in a community that's dedicated not to propagandizing you, but helping you understand Christian truth. And in the process of doing that, you have to raise all of the ultimate questions. You can't hide them. You can't cover them over with pious platitudes. I hate to go to funerals. 
because most people, when they talk at funerals, slip back into about a fourth grade Sunday school image of God and try to perfume the pain of life. Uh, again, to, to go back to my own parish church, we had a family in our church who had two daughters. And I've known these daughters since they were four years old and six months old. And when the oldest one got to be 26, he was a school teacher. I had a brilliant childhood, a brilliant teenage period of life, a brilliant college student. She wanted to be a school teacher. She was also quite athletic. So she was not climbing in the state of Washington. And her ropes broke and she fell 450 feet to her immediate death. I left this family with one sister, one younger daughter, who at that point was about four years younger than, than her now deceased sister. And about four years later, at almost the same age, she was visiting her boyfriend, who was an Indian from the subcontinent of India. And they were at a beach in India, and she and he were out in the surf, and she was eaten by a crocodile. Uh, so the family lost their second daughter, uh, both of them young, beautiful adults. And what happened to that family, and they were really at the heart of our church, they were active on the vestry, in the choir, on the search committee, one's a treasurer, one ran the Sunday school, they're part of this, what they call the Stevens ministry to reach out to people that are lonely. They were really at the heart of our church. And this terrible tragedy embraced them. I don't know how you deal with that, except that our community sort of embraced them. We didn't try to explain it or deny it or pretend it didn't happen. We just embraced them. I never will forget when we got the word of this second child's death. Um, our rector went on the, on the internet and sent out what she calls a blast to the congregation to tell them that Emily's tragedy, uh, that Emily was deceased that everybody knew Emily, she was a star in our congregation. And the rector said, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to be in the church tonight at 6 o'clock, and I'm going to be saying some prayers, and if anybody would like to come and join me, that'd be wonderful. 200 people showed up at 6 o'clock in that church. And we didn't do anything, we said gather, and I think Janet, our rector, read a couple of verses from the Psalms and had some prayers, most of which were silent because we didn't know what to say. So it was a great sense that we were together and we were not alone and we would somehow bear this pain and tragedy together. Community is terribly important, but you can't really enter into community until you're willing to give up some of your security system, you're willing to accept a certain amount of vulnerability. There's a huge difference between being vulnerable and being an exhibitionist. And you got to find that. And when you find that, then I think and I must say that I guess when I was the bishop I missed being part of a regular community. But one of the greatest things in my retirement is to be part of this particular congregation. And I don't take any special role in it. I teach the adult class five or six Sundays a year. But the rest of the time I'm in the pew with my wife and surrounded by people who are now my friends. And so I don't I don't need the liturgy for I don't need to put on vestments and parade like and the bishop seemed to love to do. I just simply enjoy being a part of that family. And it sustains me and it holds me. And I know that, that in the exigencies of life, uh, I will soon be 83, in the exigencies of life, we're going to be facing into our mortality. And all I can tell you is that, that I think we have a community that can sustain us as we walk with integrity into whatever that final moment is. And that, to me, is a really powerful idea. And I wish that I could convince individual congregations that what they have to offer is so much greater than what they seem to think they are offering. And it would make a big difference, I think. Too. When I was a bishop, he and I had about 140 churches. I think maybe no more than 12 of them would be places I would ever have felt comfortable worshiping on a regular basis. And that may be an indictment on me as a bishop. It may be an indictment on the institution as an institution. But I still think it's the truth. And, and I look back on that and I wonder how the members of those churches are fed spiritually, how they grow, and what it really does for them or to them. And it's easy for me to understand why institutional Christianity is not very healthy today. It's uh, really easy. But it's also easy for me to understand what they can be and to have experienced something of that. 
when I wrote my last book, I dedicated it to St. Peter's Church in Morristown, New Jersey, and to St. Paul's Church in Richmond, Virginia, because those are the two churches that have sustained my life in the most deep and significant way for the longest number of years. St. Paul still sustains my life. I go back to that church with regularity, and I've been gone as its rector since 1976. I don't know many people that go back to a church that they served 38 years ago and still feel the warmth of that community. And the Church of St. Peter's, where I've been a member since 1976, to the degree that a bishop can be a member, but rather intensively in the last 14 years since I've been retired. It's a very powerful experience. And I like to be in the place where I could say to church leaders, there's so much you can't be if you get off the security building system, you get off your statistical goals, and you get off trying to impress people, and you build a community where people can discover who they are, who other people are, and what it means to be human. I think that's a great vocation. Thank you. You mentioned prayer in your comments then, and I wonder if you want to make a comment on, you know, in the theistic framework, prayer was about trying to assuage fear, our own fear, and trying to invoke the, you know, the spirits to help us. In a new framework of universal consciousness, what does prayer look like, if anything? Well, yeah, it's a tough word. I love the story of the primus of Scotland, Richard Holloway, one of my favorite people, one of my best friends, who was asked by a lady in public audience on one occasion, Bishop, do you pray? And he said, no. And he waited and the lady sort of shook, couldn't process that. He's a bishop and he doesn't pray. I don't know how to put that together. And Richard is the sort of person who would let that kind of pressure hang for a very long period of time. He'd, he'd let that lady sort of turn in the breeze until the full and right moment. And then he responded, Madam, or whatever he called her. If I'd answered your question, yes, do you pray? You would have assumed that I pray like you're interpreting prayer, and that would not be true. So before I can answer that, I've got to reinterpret God and reinterpret prayer, and then we might have a common basis on which we can look at that question, and I can say a different answer to you. Right? That's where we are. Most of the talk about prayer is not something I really want to engage in. I think of God more as a as a verb that needs to be lived, and as a being that needs to be addressed. And I think prayer is more living than doing. Uh, and, and I don't know how to say that any other way. Uh, when Paul said pray without ceasing, he certainly didn't mean to say prayers without ceasing. That's a pretty boring activity. I can remember as a little child, I was taught in heaven, which where we prayed 24 hours a day. No wonder nobody wanted to go. So it was a, a funny kind of image. But I think if prayer becomes the way you live God out, the way you express God's love, the way you call others into God's being, then it becomes a very powerful influence. I don't even like to use the word prayer again, because prayer is still, for most people, means a petition of an inferior to a superior to do something that the inferior can't do by himself or herself. And I don't think that's what prayer is. So I use words like meditation and contemplation. Uh, I sit in my study working on the scriptures in the reality of God's ever-present person, whatever that word means. And I just sort of let that experience come into me. And then I try to share that experience during the day with people that I know and people that I love. I never can eat a meal without saying a grace before that meal. That may be my childhood training. It also may be that when I look at that food, I recognize that everything on that plate was once alive, either as a plant or an animal, and that it's sacrificed its life so that I may have life. And I think if you don't recognize that about every meal that you eat, you're not going to understand what it means to be human. And so I want to acknowledge that gift. I'm receiving life. And I, I console myself by knowing that someday it's going to be my turn. Uh, that is, I will be eating food, life for somebody else. I remind audiences sometimes of the song we used to sing as kids in camp. 
it says, did you ever think when the hearse goes by that you might be the next to die? And then, and then it goes on to talk about what happens when you die and the worms crawl in and the worms crawl out and the worms crawl all over your snout. Everybody is in somebody's food chain in this world. And I think to acknowledge that with gratitude every time you eat is, is just a part of awakening your consciousness to the sacredness of all of life. Uh, that doesn't make me a vegetarian, as some people think it might, but it does make me aware of that it is in giving that we receive, and somebody is always giving so that somebody else can always receive, and we have our turns, and we will all share in that process of giving and receiving. You just used, so a, you just used a beautiful phrase. You said, awaken to the consciousness of the sacredness of all of life. I think those yes. are the words that I you used. Say, I'd say that's saying it. But it's more than that, because then I think you have to live out what you're experiencing. So it's not just passive, it's active. Have you become more of a mystic in recent years? Yes, I'd say that's fair. And if anybody had told me that would be true of me, I'm a left brain, overdeveloped left brain, underdeveloped right brain rationalist. And yet, I've spent my life trying to press the edges of this faith tradition in which I live. And the more I press the edges, the more you enter into the world of mystery. I love to quote a retired bishop, and I cannot to remember what his name was now, but he said to me on one occasion, the older I get, the more deeply I believe, but the less beliefs I have. And that's exactly where I find myself. Uh, I say the creeds every Sunday. Do I believe the creeds? Well, Yes, but it depends on what you mean by belief. Uh, I think the creeds are a fourth century love song sung song by my ancestors in faith to their understanding of God. And I have no difficulty singing their song with them. Would I frame the creeds that way? No. They, they, they make assumptions that I don't think any modern man or woman can make. And so the creeds are pointers to God. They're not containers in which God somehow is able to live. And I think we need to understand that. We need to say that. So prayer changes, creeds change, liturgy, which is always the last change. And I spend a lot of my liturgical time translating some very limited words into very big concepts. I think that's what we do. Some of our hymns I've left in deep six, most of the hymns in our church, especially the ones about blood. We got a lot of bloody hymns in the hymn book. And, uh, I think they really miss the point dreadfully of what the story is all about. Thank you. We, we've come to the end of our time, and I'm just so honored that you have given us this time. I'm so glad that I've been able to introduce your liberating ideas to some new people through this conference. And I'm so grateful to you, Bishop Spong, and many good thoughts to you and Christine. Much love as you continue. This ministry, for those watching this, Bishop Spong just confessed that he's 83 years old. He didn't tell you. He's, in about a month. In about a month. He did, what he didn't tell you was that he still runs five miles a day. So uh, this is a fit man uh, with, a, with still so much to talk about and write about. And we're honored that we've had a little insight into that. Keep doing what you're doing, Bishop Spong. There, there are still people out there that need to be liberated by this message and you have Thank my you. full support. Thank you for your friendship over the years. I've always loved knowing you. And you've been a great mentor. So thank you and thank you to all of you for tuning in. Namaste.